This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Hello and welcome to another edition of Silent Voices, the only program in America that you, the viewer, can use your voice on the child welfare system. I am Dennis Lawrence and beside me is the lovely Maria Milene, our co-host. Maria, what do we have up first for our audience? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this week's guest. How's the beat? The Justice for Families video crew is here in Bel Air, Maryland to expose the unlawful incarceration of Sylvia Stoymanova Huzoris to kidnap her son. Sylvia is uh, from Bulgaria. She immigrated here and married into a wealthy family in the Bel Air area. Sylvia's ex-husband, Nick Huzoris, has a documented history of aggravated assault against Sylvia. As a result, Mr. Nick Huzoris does not have the standing to be a custodial parent. So he set about to have Sylvia unlawfully incarcerated so that he could get custody of their child. Exhibit 2 contains a doctor's report from 2005 which contains threats Mr. Huzuris was making that if she tried to divorce him he would get rid of her and take their child. Exhibits 3 and 4 contain police reports and protective orders to protect Ms. Huzuris from Mr. Nick Huzuris's aggravated assaults. Subsequently, Mr. Huzuris killed the family dog that Sylvia loved so much. He didn't have the dog put down, but killed it with a shotgun to terrorize and control his wife and their son. Mr. Huzuris and his influential family hired a insider lawyer. He suborned the judges in this court to railroad Sylvia into jail without a trial, without being able to confront her accusers. All of this is posted on the Justice for Families website. I am Zed McLarnon. Uh, I am Sylvia's expert witness, her forensic investigator. I wrote a report which they never let me uh, submit to the court. They railroaded Sylvia into jail so that they could unlawfully award custody of her child to her abusive husband. They took advantage of the fact that Sylvia went to Canada to visit extended family with her son. They issued a warrant, an Amber Alert, to arrest Sylvia for child abduction, which is totally fabricated. When she was returning from Canada, she was arrested at the border. Sylvia produced evidence for the border guards that showed that she had informed her husband that she was going to Canada with their son. She had sole custody, so she didn't need permission. When the border guards reviewed her evidence, they called Judge Carr here at the courthouse and told him that they were freeing Sylvia because his warrant was unfounded. Sylvia then went to New York, driving back to Maryland, where she was arrested for a second time. She had a, uh, a trial in New York, and the chief administrative judge there uh, found her innocent, closed the case, and said that the warrant uh, to have her arrested was unfounded. When she got back to Maryland, they arrested her for a third time. Since she had ample evidence of her innocence, including two authorities already finding her innocent, they dispensed with a trial, and her own public defender, Howard Greenberg accused her of being not competent to stand trial. In other words, they're saying she was crazy. They threw her in jail and had forced psychiatric interrogation. 
In other words, a, a state psychiatrist interviewed her for seven minutes through the bars of her cell. They declared her not competent to stand trial in defiance of the fact that a renowned forensic psychiatrist, Dr. Patricia McGraw, had done an in-depth 20-hour evaluation of Sylvia. Now, Dr. McGraw was the psychiatrist of Sylvia's choice. She found Sylvia to be completely competent and a good parent to her son. I interviewed Dr. McGraw and she told me of a horrific experience that she had in this courthouse. They brought her in and Judge Waldron lambasted her, screamed at her, and drove her out of the courtroom because they wanted to dispense with her in-depth evaluation of Sylvia and replace it with the horror of the court, Dr. Witsack, the state psychiatrist. Dr. Witsack would not answer our inquiries as to what she based her evaluation of, of Sylvia on. Sylvia competently presented her evidence to the border guards. She competently presented her evidence to the New York judge and she competently presented her evidence to the U.S. Attorney's Office here in Baltimore who also said that there was something seriously wrong going on here at the Bel Air Courthouse. State Attorney Joseph Casilli and the local prosecutor Diane Tobin continued the prosecution despite the fact that she had been found innocent by three authorities. They ignored all of that declared her incompetent and put her in a maximum security mental institution, the Perkins Hospital Center. When Sylvia first was unlawfully incarcerated here, the staff psychiatrist found her to be competent. Yet, two years later, she's still here at a maximum security mental institution. Even though she has been deemed competent, they still hold Sylvia here under the threat that if she doesn't stop talking about attorney and judicial corruption, she's never going to get out of here. Of course, that's what put her here, is judicial corruption, because she's a perfectly competent person who has done no wrong. This is happening in states all across America. Sylvia's been cut off from virtually all communication. Even though I'm her expert witness and forensic investigator, they don't allow her to communicate with me. On the few occasions that I have been able to communicate with Sylvia by phone, when they find out she's on the phone, they attack her physically and wrench the phone out of her hands so that she can't communicate with the outside world, trying to isolate her and drive her insane. I've heard nurse Renee Williams screaming, screaming at her for being on the phone and she's the one who instigated the attacks on uh, Sylvia and hanging up on us. Sylvia was forced to take psychotropic uh, medication which is also against the law and when I tried to get the transcripts of the hearings I was refused copies of the transcript. The reason why? She doesn't need uh, psychotherapeutic uh, medication. She's a completely competent person. We're here at the Maryland Office of the Public Defender. We had complained to Public Defender Paul DeWolf about Harford County Public Defender Howard Greenberg's selling Sylvia Huzuris out. He claimed that she was non-competent after she had fired him. She fired him, the judge and the public defender's office wouldn't let him be fired. Why? Because he was the one who claimed that Sylvia was not competent, her own lawyer. This is happening all over the country, not just to Sylvia. I haven't run into a case where a public defender has actually pleaded innocent for his client. All they care about is getting a plea bargain and handling more and more caseloads. When we complained to public defender DeWolf about Greenberg's malfeasance, he wrote a letter commending public defender Greenberg for his actions in Sylvia's case, commending him for selling out his client. Neither public defender DeWolf nor 
Greenberg in Harford County could refute any of the allegations that we made about their malfeasance regarding Sylvia's case. We're here at the offices of the Attorney General of Maryland, Douglas Gansler. He would not appear on camera to answer our allegations about the malfeasance of the state's attorney, Casilli, regarding the malicious prosecution of Sylvia Huzuris. Attorney General Gansler's malfeasance and corruption is reflected across America. Most attorney generals do not police their state's attorneys. They carry out a malicious prosecution for profit racketeering scheme here in Maryland and just about every state across America. We're here at the United States District Courthouse in Baltimore, Maryland. This is where Sylvia's mother and several of her next friends submitted a habeas corpus to have Sylvia released because of the judicial and attorney corruption involved in her case. U.S. District Court Judge Motts used fraud to dismiss Sylvia's habeas corpus petition. Your tax dollars are supporting federal courthouses like this across the country where federal judges cover up the crimes of state judges. So where do you go when you've been unlawfully incarcerated to have your son or daughter kidnapped from you in state courts by state judges and lawyers that are corrupt and commit malfeasance on a daily basis? Where do you go when you come to federal courts like this for relief and you run into yet more corruption? Where do you go? Sylvia visited the U.S. Attorney's Office here with a witness who stated in an affidavit that Assistant U.S. Attorney Richard Kay said that there's something seriously wrong in Harford County Courts. Yet, the U.S. Attorney, Rod Rosenstein, did nothing. Your tax dollars are funding U.S. attorneys across the country that allow states to operate courts as criminal enterprises. And the Department of Justice, in which Eric Holder is the head, allows courts to kidnap children and throw their parents into mental institutions. How can state and federal courts operate overtly as criminal enterprises? because media outlets like the Baltimore Sun here refuse to report on the capital crimes that occur in state and federal courthouses. I submitted Sylvia's evidence to two journalists at the Baltimore Sun. They refused to report on her story and report of the crimes that occur in state and federal court. They virtually told me to get lost. They don't care. The Aegis is Bel Air's local newspaper. It's owned by the Baltimore Sun. They incorrectly reported that Sylvia's husband had sole custody and Sylvia abducted their child. I contacted the editor and asked him to correct the article, but he refused. As a result, the community believes that Sylvia abducted her child. This is an example of how judges control the record in Harford County courts and newspapers who knowingly used fraud to railroad Sylvia Huzuris into jail. We're here in front of the law offices of John Karras and Daniel Donlick. These lawyers are typical of corrupt lawyers across the country who have influence over judges to railroad innocent parents into jail to unlawfully award custody of children. It's human trafficking of children for profit. We're in Annapolis, Maryland, at the Governor's Mansion. Governor Martin O'Malley, I've uh, been in contact with his office regarding unlawful incarceration of Sylvia Huzuris and the overt corruption of Attorney General Gansler, Public Defender DeWolf, State's Attorney Gasilli, specifically asking him to comment or refute our charges that uh, his administration offers a service to corrupt judges and lawyers to get rid of, unlawfully incarcerate, vulnerable single mothers like Sylvia. To date, neither Governor O'Malley, Attorney General Gansler, Public Defender, DeWolf, 
None of them have been able to refute any of the allegations regarding the unlawful incarceration of Sylvia to kidnap her son. How can the O'Malley administration pretend to uphold the convictions of Thurgood Marshall when they are railroading innocent citizens of Maryland into jail to kidnap their children? Law office. May I speak to Camilla, please? This is she. Camilla, hi. This is uh, Zed McLaren, and I spoke to you before regarding Sylvia Huzuris. Yes. We're in town shooting a documentary on uh, Sylvia's case, and I was wondering if we could get together to, uh, with you to discuss the, uh, your part uh, of the case. No, I'm not interested in doing that, Zeb, but thank you for the offer. You sure you don't want to help out your client? She's no longer my client. I was not, I was not her attorney. I was her guardian ad litem. Right, but uh, you, one of the things you said to me before was that, uh, that you didn't understand why she was in the Perkins. Deb, I'm sorry, I'm not going to get involved in this, but thank you for the offer. Okay, well, we'll download your website and narrate over it and tell, tell everybody what you did. Okay? Uh, no, that's not okay. <laughs> it's going to be okay because that's what we're going to do. You're not going to get away with doing what you did. Just uh, take money and uh, abscond with it, help the, help the state plunder her, her estate. Hung up. Another lawyer. This is attorney Camilla Rogers, another whore of the court appointed under the pretext of representing Miss Huzuris's best interests. When I first spoke to attorney Rogers, she told me that after reviewing all of Sylvia's evidence, she could find no reason why she was in jail or a mental institution. Sylvia also fired attorney Rogers, but of course the judges refused to allow Sylvia a GAL of her own choice. Attorney Rogers conspired with the judges and the other court-appointed lawyers to liquidate Sylvia's estate and divide it up amongst themselves. Miss Huzuris is a highly functioning individual. She has a master's degree in music and worked as a teacher. Her mother, Iveta, ran this daycare center, which is now empty and represents yet another thriving business destroyed by the legal industry for profit using KGB tactics such as unlawful detention, malicious prosecution, forced psychiatric interrogation, and forced psychotropic drugs these very tactics are now being used here to force innocent American citizens to transfer all of their funds into the legal industry or they'll never get out of jail. I filed a criminal complaint with the Maryland State Police. I spoke with Trooper Knight and for almost a half hour unsuccessfully tried to have him address the evidence that proved Miss Huzuris innocent. Trooper Knight said he had started an investigation of me and that I wasn't a forensic investigator and implied I was Miss Huzuris' boyfriend. I assured him I had never met Miss Huzuris and that her exhibits told the story and not me. When he still wouldn't address the evidence, we arranged for him to record our review of Miss Huzuris' exculpatory evidence. Of course, Trooper Knight never got back to me, and like every other official in Maryland's state-sanctioned kidnapping scheme, the state police don't have the balls to discuss Ms. Huzuris' evidence on the record. Go to YouTube and type in Soviet refugee, American refugee, and learn about the state-sanctioned kidnapping of Elena Katz's child. She was brought up in the Soviet Union and came to America for a better life, only to have her daughter kidnapped by the New Hampshire Kidnap for Profit scheme run by Attorney General Kelly Ayotte and Governor John Lynch, using the same KGB-style tactics. You'll hear Elena complain that the American justice system is worse than the KGB because the KGB never targeted children. A powerful statement from someone who's experienced both systems. Child Protective Services told Elena they were going to destroy her family. Please note the similarity with Sylvia's case, which also started out with a threat and a vendetta. In both Sylvia and Elena's cases, they presented evidence to the court that proved their innocence, but the judges ignored it. Elena and her daughter fled to Massachusetts for protection from the vendetta of the New Hampshire authorities. 
She was arrested in Massachusetts with the signatures of Attorney General Martha Coakley and Governor Deval Patrick. They signed an arrest warrant based on the word of Attorney General Ayotte and Governor Lynch. After she was arrested, Elena demanded to see the arrest warrant from New Hampshire. They kept her in jail for a year with the threat that she would never get out if she didn't stop asking for the arrest warrants. Sound familiar? Sylvia Huzuris is still being unlawfully held with the same threat that if she doesn't stop talking about judicial corruption, she'll never get out. Massachusetts Attorney General Martha Coakley also worked with Massachusetts Governor William Weld to help kidnap my son using illegally altered court hearing tapes, transcripts, and dockets. As with Sylvia and Elena's case, I too was unlawfully incarcerated, maliciously prosecuted, and unlawfully assessed $20,000 in court fees. And two days after I proved to the court that the district attorney was using altered documents to railroad me into jail, I was dragged from my car, beaten and hospitalized by two off-duty state troopers with the threat that if I ever go back to court, I'll never see my son again. The same KGB tactics as used in Sylvia's case, Elena's, and countless other victims across the country. Eventually, the evidence I presented forced Attorney General Coakley to admit in federal court that Massachusetts judges and lawyers operate courts as criminal enterprises. But she conspired with U.S. District Court Judge Rhea Zobel to alter the dockets in U.S. District Court to dismiss my case. Attorney General Coakley also worked with this governor, Mitt Romney. Governor Romney's staff scheduled an appointment after they reviewed my evidence proving Massachusetts courts alter records to kidnap children like my son Ian. Governor Romney canceled the meeting at the last minute with no explanation and turned away while the Massachusetts court system continued to kidnap children for profit. And Governor Romney stood by and watched while the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, the same judges that legislated from the bench the gay marriage law, used my case to rewrite the Massachusetts anti slap law to immunize my ex-wife and all women who commit perjury and immunize her social worker husband and all social workers that submit fraudulent evaluations. The author of the anti slap law, State Representative Philip Travis, and not Governor Romney, helped me sponsor a bill of address to remove Margaret Marshall, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court, for legislating from the bench and treason. Governor Romney also went on to deny he knew anything about the Violence Against Women Act, which brought hundreds of millions of dollars into his state each year to target one group for destruction. Governor Romney, like every governor in the country and every attorney general and every lawyer and judge, knows that the Violence Against Women Act is unconstitutional because it violates the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. And considering that Judges have revealed that about 70 to 80 percent of the abuse allegations against men are false. There's no reason to pass unconstitutional hate legislation that targets one group for destruction unless you're doing it to fund a malicious prosecution for profit scheme. For example, in the Duke Lacrosse case, why did prosecutor Mike Nifong continue to prosecute the Duke Lacrosse players after he discovered that they were innocent? for Violence Against Women Act funds. And what happened to Prosecutor Nifong for unlawfully plundering taxpayer money in the form of Violence Against Women Act funds? Nothing. Nothing. The Duke Lacrosse players' families were destroyed financially, but none of the perpetrators of the malicious prosecution were held responsible. The Child Support Incentive Grant is another unconstitutional funding source that rewards states and their judges for getting rid of the father and creating child support payments. This funding source is the sole reason why judges rarely award joint custody. Federal funds are fueling the malicious prosecution for profit schemes run by lawyers and judges in state and federal courts while governors like Mitt Romney claim they know nothing about these lawyer-run racketeering schemes. 
Also on YouTube is a video called Deconstructing America, Part 1 and 2. It contains interviews with many parents who lost their children by way of courts illegally altering transcripts and hearing tapes to remove the evidence of their innocence. Illegally editing court hearing tapes or manipulating the court files. And several lawyers who were disbarred for complaining that their clients' tapes were illegally altered to unlawfully take their children. Children are removed from their parents without any show of wrongdoing. This amounts to nothing more than a state-sanctioned kidnapping. This is Representative Darrell Issa, chairman of the House Oversight Committee. He declared on comedian Bill Maher's real time that there is no tyranny in America. To have a right both to protect themselves and to be protected from living under tyranny. Nobody in this room well, has lived under tyranny. Just give me that is a degenerate lie because I supplied Representative Issa and his oversight committee and Lamar Smith and his judiciary committee and Attorney General Eric Holder with the evidence to prove that every agency of the Department of Justice has first-hand knowledge that state and federal courts are altering court records Yet, under the supervision of President Obama and Attorney General Eric Holder, the FBI, U.S. Marshals, U.S. Attorneys, and the Inspector General's Office all are suppressing evidence to allow judges and lawyers to operate courts as criminal enterprises in which they terrorize and destroy innocent American parents and children for profit. Lawyers, judges, and politicians gain power by suppressing and ignoring evidence. That's why Representative Issa and Representative Smith won't allow me or other victims of state-sanctioned kidnapping to testify before their committees on the record. When President Obama appointed Joe Biden the author of the Unconstitutional Violence Against Women Act, he sent a clear message to all lawyers and judges. Business as usual. Continue the malicious prosecution of parents and the human trafficking of children for profit as there will be no oversight from the Obama administration in violation of the President and Eric Holder's oath to the Constitution. We need to hold people accountable. And that's, uh, we're bound and determined to do that here at the Justice Department. Can we the evidence reveals that America is not a country of laws, but a country of the lawyers, by the lawyers, and for the lawyers, and the racketeering schemes they operate in state and federal courts. Is there another country where the president, vice president, legislature, Department of Justice, and local lawyers conspire with a corrupt judiciary to maliciously prosecute parents and human traffic and children for profit? Join Justice for Families to help free Sylvia Huzuris and end state-sanctioned kidnapping for profit.